Perfect. Hi, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the Mentality Monday's Healthy Masculinity Conversation Series. My name is Anthony Siliberto, and I am the Assistant Director for Fraternity and Sorority Programs here at Tulane. Um, I'm joined by my co-host, um, Magnus, and I'll let him introduce himself, and our great guest speaker, um, Dr. Julia Fleckman. Um, so, Magnus, if you want to introduce yourself and the work that you're doing. Hey everybody, I'm Magnus Dallier. I'm the Mentality Project Coordinator. I'm a senior psychology major, uh, and I, my focus areas are healthy masculinity, violence prevention, and healthy relationships. Awesome. Um, and just kicking off, kicking off our conversation, Dr. Fleckman, can you just tell us a bit about your position at Tulane and where your specialties lie? Sure. So hi everyone, thanks for having me here today. I'm Dr. Julia Fleckman. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine in the Department of Global Community Health and Behavioral Sciences. <laughs> Such a mouthful, I can always, I always trip that up. Anyways, um, so yeah, I'm an assistant professor. I'm also the associate director of the Violence Prevention Institute, which is an interdisciplinary institute um, that has a broad range of faculty across pretty much every school at Tulane. Um, is our home base is within the School of Public Health, but have about 50 faculty across uh, schools and departments. And uh, my area of focus, or areas of focus, I should say, um, are really around violence prevention, and um, that's really specific to uh, structural violence and family violence, and how those two are interrelated, and then sexual violence as well. So, um, yeah, excited to be with you all today. We're excited to have you. Um, would you mind telling me a little bit more about what drove you to do the work that you do? That's a great question. Uh, I think... So what really drove me to do this work was um, it, really two things, um, you know, personal experience, um, growing up in a household where there was, you know, quite a bit of family violence and how that impacted my trajectory, particularly as um, a young person. And I was involved um, in a really wonderful mentorship program when I was in high school that sort of changed things for me um, and allowed me to kind of see the possibilities of um, when you have that support and mentorship and are able to kind of figure out um, for yourself how to, you know, establish healthy relationships and not just sexual relationships, but any type of relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. And then I think too, you know, um, in early on in my professional career, I knew I was sort of interested in public health, um, but wanted to get some really solid kind of real world experience before going back to school. I wasn't really sure necessarily what that looked like um, to be involved in the public health realm. So I worked for a, you know, a couple of different um, organizations, but one in particular where, particular where I worked with young people, um, like myself, um, um, when I was in high school and really um, kind of figuring out more of like a youth leadership development program. And something that I really noticed um, was A, sort of the power of a program like that, and B, really similar um, early life experiences for folks that were involved in that program and how that sort of led them to, um, you know, have more interaction with the juvenile justice system, have kind of unstable um, relationships, struggle in school, um, things, you know, that really commonly we might see as like kids acting out or, you know, as labeled often really problematically as like bad behavior, when in fact these, um, these folks had really experienced substantial trauma um, that had led them to where they were. Um, and with sort of even just like a little bit of reframing and um, support, right? Um, really showing folks that you could be a significant support in their lives, things could change. Um, so, you know, I started to think more and more about those, those types of experiences with violence and trauma and A, how we might um, best support folks that have experienced that, but B, also, thinking more about uh, prevention and prevention before these things happened from a policy and a program angle. How could we really think about those things differently, right? Um, and sort of the interconnectedness of violence um, and trauma, right? Is that, you know, oftentimes when you, um, when I spoke to folks that were experiencing relationship violence or even sexual violence, um, that was oftentimes, you know, as a result of earlier experiences with, with violence and trauma that really, Kind of modeled for them um, the type of types of behaviors and relationships they should have um, and really thinking about that differently like how do we kind of um, impact those folks that 
you know, I've experienced it. Yeah. Thank I could talk about that one question forever, <laughs> right. but I know I'm, I'll, I'll just shut up right there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I know I have a follow-up question just based off of that. Um, yeah. Within your work and having these conversations around um, relationships and trauma and sexual violence, um, when talking specifically to masculine identified folks, did you notice any patterns or trends within those conversations? Um, or were they kind of like resistant to having those conversations? Um, anything of that? Yeah, I think that's a really, um, that's a really important question. And we've got to start talking about, you know, you, I know this, you both um, are focused on this area. We've got to start talking about masculinity and how that's defined and what that means. Mm -hmm. And particularly like the social norms that come into play. Um, so I did, you know, I did notice something that I think a couple of things that are really, really important is the one uh, being that these folks had really seen sort of toxic masculinity modeled to them within their home lives um, at a young age. So, you know, see either witnessing something with their own parents or, um, or being told um, that they should be acting a particular way as a young boy and what that meant and not really allowing um, them to kind of figure out for themselves how to express emotion, express different types of emotions, not just anger, um, how to actively listen, how to communicate. Um, some of those key things where it was really, you know, a lot of the messaging of like man up or be a man, don't show how you feel, um, and that definitely impacted um, a lot of the young men I worked with, you know, it was definitely, first of all, like, I, I want to recognize the intersectionality of this is like, I am a white woman, right? So there were a couple of different layers when I was working with, you know, predominantly BIPOC students and um, high school students where not only was I ta uh, like identified as a woman where there was, you know, some resistance to communication with me, but I was also seen and rightfully so as someone with privilege and power um, that some of these other folks didn't have or experience. Um, so there was definitely resistance in developing those relationships and maybe, you know, who should be the person doing that type of work? You know, I still think a lot about that is, um, I think at, at a young age, I assumed that I had a role to play in that work and perhaps that's, you know, I think I've learned over time um, through direct experience that maybe that's not the role for me, right? I think that, they really needed to see and, and um, you know, healthy role models or other young men of color mm -hmm. um, and in developing those types of relationships. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think there was a lot of that. There was that being told not only within your family, but, you know, really in many other aspects at school, you know, being labeled the problem kids, um, you know, versus really discussing with them, um, you know, um, I think about this in terms of education too, you know, in a young age in an educational setting is like, how do we talk to kids about emotions, about communication, mm -hmm. about anger and control, about, um, you know, what healthy relationships are, you know, not just what consent is, not just within like the direct realm of sexual violence, but as a method for sexual violence prevention, you know, mm -hmm. we need to allow folks to develop all sorts of healthy relationships, um, not just within, you know, sexual violence Certainly. or consent in that way. Yeah. Yeah. And going off that too, just one area of interest for me is a healthy relationship with yourself. You know, so much of our totally. well-being depends on our ability to kind of uh, tolerate a lot of uh, inability to control every aspect of your life and being able to be okay with that and, you know, relinquishing some of that, that need, some of that power. Um, so one of the things that you're talking about uh, led me to this question, which is just sort of what does masculinity mean to you? Um, you know, if, if you touch on that, yeah, question, it. such a complicated <laughs> question. Yeah. <laughs> but no, but you're right. I mean, like, and I think it's a lot of what we're talking about here. I think there's sort of what we've seen is like traditional masculinity, which can be very toxic, which is that kind of feeling of uh, or that that norm that you should man up and not show how you're feeling, um, that you should not be like emotionally supportive towards other people, um, that you should, um, you know, there's, there's like a sense of control and power that you should have as a man. Um, but I think that masculinity to me over time has really shifted, you know, um, and putting folks within this like binary 
establishment of like your masculine or your feminine is extremely problematic because I see that on the other end too when we talk about femininity um but there's got to be a place where we have elements of both of these traditional um, pieces for everyone and I really think too it's um when I think about healthy masculinity like for me it's um teaching young boys and young men and other folks who internalize and experience the results of that toxic masculinity and oftentimes you know there's internalized um, toxic masculinity for all for everyone to a certain degree um, to figure out how to um, again like express your feelings and emotions in a constructive way being able to tell someone without fear of being reprimanded or, or being shamed if you're really sad and what that means um, being able to listen to someone else as they express those emotions and provide that type of emotional support of just being there and actively listening um, communicating your needs, right? And your boundaries. Um, I think that's a really important piece of it too and saying, you know, um, and I think a big part, Magnus, you hit on something really important is having that relationship with yourself first, right? Um, you're not, it's impossible to do that in a relationship if you can't do that with yourself and you can't really figure out for yourself what you need and how you feel. And then we can talk about like expressing that with other people, right? Um, I also think a lot of, um, about, uh, to consent and what consent means, um, you know, and that's not just, um, I think, you know, for better or for worse, we've sort of defined consent in within, um, sexual relationships and that there's certainly a really, really important need to talk about consent in sexual relationships, but it far extends beyond the realm of sexual relationships, you know, something, um, that, you know, this is a really great example that I've seen, um, particularly in early childhood education as a way to kind of teach kids about consent is um, teachers will, as uh, students are entering the classroom, right, um, they'll give them kind of an option of like, without any questioning, right, of like, you just point to what you want, or you just walk past me. And some of those choices are you can give me a high five, you can say hi, you can ask for a hug, you can just walk past me and say nothing. Um, yeah. You have the choice in this situation um, as you know, giving children that agency to make those choices for themselves based on how they're feeling, right? Um, and that the teacher really respects those boundaries without any kind of questioning of, of what that child decides. Um, so I think that's a really, you know, like a kind of a clear cut example of what that may or may not look like. And, and being able to allow people like, making that okay, allowing for that norm to like, that's the norm, right? Is allowing people to say what they are and are not okay with and actively asking for that consent, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, that's great. I also think uh, kind of something you, you were touching on a little bit there is just um, with respect to the self and relationships with the self and being able to be, be a good support system for others as well, you have to be able to reach out on your own. You have to be okay with, uh, you know, seeking support from outside of yourself. Yeah. Not being the most competitive, the most successive, uh, successful, the most self-sufficient, I can take it all on person. Um, you have to be able to, to accept that you are human and that you at times need an outside perspective. So um, I think that's really, really great that you're, you're kind of getting on that as well with just like how we teach each other to support yeah. everybody. And yeah, I think, like, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, um, it's recognizing that it's not a weakness, right? I think we play like, what are our weaknesses? What are our strengths? We always have to play to our strengths. And reaching out is not a weakness. That's something we need as a human being, right? Like we, yeah. have, like, we need that for ourselves to continue to be successful and continue to thrive in our daily lives. Yeah, and I think there's, uh, you both are touching on something I, that I think is, really valuable and like just unpacking that even more is that I think that we have there's this norm of like um that failure is unacceptable in a way you know so I think this ties into you know when we think about like toxic masculinity on all levels and frankly like patriarchy on all levels um you think really specifically about this we all internalize this you know um of like it's not okay to fail right and and failure is not an option and that you should feel bad about failure when maybe failure well a maybe it shouldn't be called failure and b it's okay <laughs> we all mess up we all we all do it and and being able to say that and take responsibility for that and again as you both were saying is to ask for help when you need it 
ask for support when you need it is, is human um, and, and should be more normalized. Because I think, again, like, I mean, I see this on sort of all levels of just like what it means to be successful in this um, really, I don't know, like we, we just have a hard time, I think, psychologically admitting failure. Yes, absolutely. And I think in our, in college, I think it is, you don't want to be that vulnerable person that admits failure. Yeah. That's when you see all of your peers and even just as a staff at Tulane, the expectation on our students is so high. What from themselves that like they have, because, you know, a colleague said it, they're all coming from institutions or high schools where they were used to being like on the top of things, right? And now you're on this playing field with people that are coming exactly from the same same group. And that extra, like that is an extra layer of competitiveness and wanting to be successful and striving to be the best when it's okay, like when you don't, when you aren't the best or you don't meet expectation, those expectations that are placed upon you by yourself or family, friends, et cetera. Yeah, totally. So much pressure, you know? Yes. Yes. Um, A few pieces that I got from your answer on that is I used to be a pre-K teacher. So this conception of like, um, I read a research article um, not too long ago where it's between ages five and seven, male-identified boys will like start seeing that emotion, like the emotions between happy and mad, right? Like that's the two binary emotions that like you relate to and everything else is considered negative, right? Like you shouldn't show that you're sad or crying or you should man up quote unquote and things like that so i appreciate you acknowledging the emotional part because i think that just continues to progress as like we move on where like yeah we should just be happy or we should just be like pretty aggressive (laughs) right it's 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 overdue for us to kind of move beyond the realm of like traditional sexual violence prevention and what we mean by that in terms of research and like we know that social emotional development matters Mm -hmm. maybe more than most things and it needs to start young um otherwise it will just continue and be further perpetrated you know or perpetuated i should say yeah absolutely and i i love that you referenced those videos i've been seeing them more and more of the teachers having the options when students go into their classrooms at all different ages too but really starting young with it is important yeah Awesome. Um, I think the a follow-up question that we have is, one, why does masculinity matter in these conversations um, and as a topic to be discussed? And then also, like, why should it matter to Tulane students to have these conversations? Absolutely. Um, I think, well, I think a couple of things. I think masculinity matters because we all have these internalized forms of kind of like toxic masculinity. And you see that play out um, in terms of sexual violence, particularly amongst college students um, on a number of different levels. Um, I think there's, you know, when you and you kind of allow for this like more toxic development of, um, of emotional development, where that you need kind of power and control and one, one thing and then B, you know, you really um, don't know how to communicate in a way um, that, you know, uh, really allows for that consent piece to come in, um, particularly um, at an age where, like, everybody's finding themselves sexually. Um, Then that's where we can sometimes see uh, sexual violence happen, you know? Um, And it's really nuanced and complicated. You know, I think a lot of times when we think about uh, sexual violence in particular, we think about our mind immediately goes to like very clear examples of sexual assault. But there's so many types of sexual violence that happen in a more nuanced way, where I think what happens too is like someone's not doesn't even, what I want to say is like what we know from research is that, you know, there's a very, very small percentage of perpetrators that are actively seeking out like harm, you know, they really, really want to hurt somebody. They want to hurt someone bad, right? It's much more nuanced than that in the sense that sometimes people don't know that they're doing it or, you know, that aren't willing to accept it, I think. Um, And we see that a lot on college campuses for, you know, a number of reasons. Like it's the first time people are away from home, you know, and living in really, it's maybe one of the only times, really, I mean, I can't think of another time in life where you're living in such close proximity with other folks, um, you know, of the same age. 
Um, and in a country where we don't have um, really responsive um, relationship um, education or um, sexual health education, you know, and where there's a lot of stigma around talking about these things. And some people have been told, you know, abstinence only, or um, some people have been told like pretty big misconceptions about what sex looks like and what it should mean. Um, and people are looking at, you know, to um, really problematic representations of sex. Um, that's what you're going to do because that's what you know. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, I, I, I think that's something uh, that, that you see definitely at Tulane, right? Um, and I can tell you, like, you know, I'm sure we can all say this, like, um, you know, when I was in college 15 years ago, it was really very much the same. Like, I don't think that this, this has changed as much as it should, you know, and we've all sort of had those experiences, too, where, you know, I reflect back on um, some things I heard or said or, um, you know, situations that played out where at the, in that moment, I didn't necessarily know how problematic it was, but it sits with you and it doesn't go away. Um, and it can kind of impact, you know, who you are. Um, and so I think that's one of the big reasons why it matters is like, we've got to start talking about this stuff. Um, this is a real opportunity, you know, for students to, instead of kind of just uh, perpetuating these norm, these like really toxic norms and behaviors, um, we can really start to dig into meaningful dialogue about masculinity and what masculinity should mean, you know, to folks. We should allow people to um, to learn about sex, you know, and consent without fear, you know, without stigma. Um, we should allow for people to find um, pleasure out of that, you know pleasure in like a, in a, in a way that's um, both like healthy and, 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 and supportive of everyone involved, you know, um, that's something I think about a lot is just that when we sort of set people up again for failure in this, in this way, where, I mean, how would you know what to do if you've basically been told for your entire adolescence that this is something you shouldn't be talking about, or even if you do talk about it, it's on such a, like a limited capacity that, you know, folks don't really have the opportunity to like really dig into that. Um, yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. You know, I, it's amazing to me still um, in my undergraduate class with um, it's public health approaches to sexual violence. Obviously there's some really incredible student activists that work in this realm in that class who really have d dug into this, but the majority of students in that class don't even really know what sex, what, sex is or how to de define consent moving in moving really when you dig into consent you know and and what that means there's a lot of misinformation um you know i had someone ask me recently like if um having sex while you're drunk is illegal i mean that's that's just one example of like the lack of understanding of sort of like the nuances when it's not that it's illegal it's that when one person is intoxicated to the point where they're incapacitated to be able to give you consent that's where you come, you know, into some, and it, it, that's where it becomes problematic. Um, but we just kind of put these like blanket statements on, on, and what we're thinking. Um, so really being able to unpack that, I think is, we're in a really important space to do that. Absolutely. Um, I was going to ask kind of a two tiered question that sort of came out of that. One is a question that another student has asked me in the past, uh, that I thought was pretty pretty important. Uh, and then the other one is kind of the solution side of things based on what you were just saying. So first I wanted to ask uh, what the student asked me, which is, you know, why, why do we connect masculinity or any gender really to these unhealthy behaviors? Why is there a connection there? Why should we be talking about it as a masculinity problem? And then two, um, how do you see talking about masculinity? You were talking about, you know, creating a space and health, uh, sexual health education, relationship education. How do you see masculinity uh, involved in the solution to that, in, in that discussion, if that makes sense? It definitely does. Um, and I think those are really great questions. Um, so I think what we have to do when we do, why does masculinity matter? Because we live um, in a society where norms have allowed masculinity and femininity, femininity to be this, this very polarizing binary experience, right? Mm -hmm. That if you were born as a male, 
there are these like norms that have how you should be, how you should act, what you should do. And if you're born as a woman, as a girl, this is what you should do. This is how you should act, right? It's human behavior is so much more nuanced than that. So that's why we have to talk about it because that's how it's been defined for us. Mm -hmm. And if we're ever going to move past that and understand that it is a spectrum, right? You don't have to incorporate all of these just like very stereotypical masculine or feminine behaviors. If we can't talk about that and tease those apart, I don't think that will change, right? I mean, that's, that's, how, that's why, how it's continued to play out the way it's played out is because we've just allowed it to sit. Um, I see a lot of the other, you know, beyond sexism, I see a lot of the other isms playing out the same way. It's because we refuse to acknowledge them. We refuse to acknowledge them and accept them as reality and go through the process of pulling them apart. Mm -hmm. um, and until we do that and like take responsibility that, that this is how it's played out, it won't change, right? There's too much like uh, emotion there um, for people to really like accept unless we, you know, tease those things apart. So I think that's the first piece of that. And then in terms of, um, how, you know, how do we go about like addressing it? Um, I think that's a complicated question and I, I, I think, but I think you two are doing it mm -hmm. and you're seeing it in your own work. Um, and I think there's still a long way to go in understanding that. But again, it's like, we've got to provide a spaces a for people to come to terms with this stuff. You know, if we don't provide them like it's, it's emotionally wrought in a way, you know, like I know for myself when I started to think about this and like my, just as an, like an individual, like my own um, sexual and gender identity and like what that meant and how I'd been um, taught to act and behave and started to like really pull that apart. I mean, I needed a lot of therapy, <laughs> to be honest, you know? Um, and unless we provide a space where people have that support to go through that practice, process and I think support is really really important so for example some of the work you all have been doing um, to pr provide a space for male identifying folks to unpack how they have internalized toxic masculinity and what that has done for them personally and in their groups of friends and I think that's a really important space because until you can feel like you have that support it's, you're never going to let that go mm -hmm. um, you're never going to let it go you know it's taken me 10 years in this work to really start to let that go. And I think the more that we can promote those spaces to allow people to do that, um, the more we're gonna start to see these things shift. Um, so I think that, again, like we're at a really, like we have a really unique opportunity within the Tulane environment to do that. Um, but, you know, as I said before, like it should be happening at different ages. This is not like a one and done type solution either. And um, talked a lot about this with uh, Jennifer Hunt too, is like, we have yes. to think about this at different levels and how we actually sort of allow for these norms to shift um, and allowing people to kind of process those things too. I hope that answered your question. It did, yeah. No, I think that was great. I mean, like you said, you know, this is a developmental thing. This is, it's a multifaceted issue and solution and it's taking a lot of time to to figure out how we're going to go about it and we have to start doing that now by having these conversations and creating those spaces i completely agree right. um i think it is complicated but I completely yeah agree. and i mean and that's the thing too is i think people see it as complicated and so they're just like oh well it's too hard i'm not going to do it but again like we've got to dive in at some point and we've got to figure it out and i think there is quite a bit of um research out there to start to steer us in the right direction, right? Mm -hmm. I should say research and practice, because there's a lot of practitioners that have done really incredible work in this realm that know where the solution lies mm -hmm. um, or where we need to be focusing. And so we've got to start to, to do those things um, and think about that like multi-system mm -hmm. comprehensive approach to doing so. And we each kind of have different roles to play in that. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And I think it is a process, right? Having these spaces, you can't expect, you know, a large group to attend your first meeting or like no. to the first thing. It is a process. And it, even if one, two, three, possibly up to like five or six people come to that, that is a space where they feel com comfortable and possibly empowered to share their viewpoints on these topics. And that to me is successful in moving the needle forward, right? And starting to have these conversations. So hopefully they, student, the students we're working with, have them within their friend groups 
and like inspires other people to either come and unpack some of this work um, or just talk through things as a group together, right? Like you're more likely to have conversations with your friends that are meaningful and successful if it's either one-on-one -on -one or a small group. So that's my goal from this. And I think that took me a long time to recognize in this work is like, you're not gonna change things at one time. <laughs> like it has to be a process and it has to be, you have to recognize it's gradual. It may not happen in the first like two years of a program. It could take a while, but that's okay. And recognizing that and being okay with that is important. Yeah, I think you're saying something really important is like for those of us um, in this work is change is slow and it's minute, you know, and that's okay. Like, and it's, it, it can be frustrating. It's not like we see some really tangible results, right? Of yeah. like, I'm building a house. My house is complete. It's done. You know, like it's going to be really, really subtle shifts that we may not even be able to like really see sometimes. Um, and that's okay. I think again, like we each have our roles to play in sort of dismantling this structure. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and that's another part of like that being okay with yourself bit of like, that's something you have to be okay with too. Totally. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's definitely something that, that is easy. It's easy to find yourself wanting to change um, a social issue overnight for sure. And, and oftentimes it's not possible. So just recognizing kind of like you're saying, being okay with yourself and, and, and acknowledging that, you know, if one or two or three or four people go home actually changed or actually starting to think about these things a lot more and they're able to then you know reach out for support when they need it or or check themselves and say hey you know i don't need to be the best of the best of the best at this thing or i don't need to keep pushing myself this hard right now they might have better life outcomes as a result of that and their relationships with other people might be better because of it so it's huge just one person at a time is huge and uh i think it's an important thing for me at least to remember hey, you know, we're, we're still making progress, even if it's not a wide scale, campus wide thing that's immediately, you know, fixing these problems that we're noticing, so. True, yeah, I think so. You know, if I can get at the end of the semester with this class, if I can get a couple of students to say, you, you know, this class has really made me rethink, you know, the way I grew up and the way that I experienced these things and what I wanna do as a result of this, like, that's it that's great, you know, like, just to think about little things a little bit differently. Um, I think that's the goal. Um, and I get something out of that, too. I've learned over, you know, over the past couple of years of TNF class, I've learned so much from students, you know, that are doing this work, too, is just how do we, like, appreciate and, and learn from one another. Um, that's a really important piece of it, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the other thing that we have talked about throughout the conversation is the support piece. Like you need that piece of support also to help guide that journey. Um, yep. Yeah. Like I think that is important. I think that I will say for myself, I would get in my head about like people will think like this isn't the norm for people to feel like talk about masculinity and how it's in relationship to other um, facets of my life or like, me wanting to do work within sexual violence prevention, but that's a big piece of it, right? Is how do we have this conversation and feel supported um, in the groups that we already are, are a part of? Um, and I think Magnus, right? Like we talk about how we want to work with in fraternity life a lot um, because we are both affiliated. And like, how do we have these conversations with our brothers and then also with yeah. different chapters? Mm -hmm. Especially because like, I see a lot of that group think happen in some of our organizations. And I will say it happened in my organization as an under, undergrad. Um, and it took a few of us starting the conversations around like, let's get involved. Like, let's actually be promoters of um, ending sexual violence on our campus and like dive into the conversation. And with that also comes the, you have to be able to take what other people are going to ask you and say like, well, this happens a lot in fraternities. How are you different? Why are you not the stereotype? And like, how are we having those conversations while offering support. Totally. Yep. I keep thinking about, I mean, I was in, first of all, and people will hear that I was in a sorority. Most of my personal friends are like, no way, <laughs> but definitely, you know, and, and, and what that felt like and, and how that has in some ways impacted, you know, my thinking about this now, just being able to process and say like that group, I think what you, you said is, is right on is just that group think, right? Um, because I think we had this, 
idea too that um, like peer influence and like well and support can be only good and that's not true um, you know I think we again like internalize a lot of these things and it's really easy to fall into this pattern where you're like out just out of pure pressure because you think everybody else is doing something a particular way or people would approve or disapprove of you know a particular thing like that influences what you do and that doesn't matter how old you are like I, I would say as an adult there's still definitely that element of like peer pressure um so how do you like allow for your own like again that kind of like alternative space to process it differently yeah um, no social learning and group think are definitely massive contributors to these issues just at least when it comes down to competitiveness and to you know, self-sufficiency and being yeah. somebody that's invulnerable and invincible, able to take on the entire world on your own, uh, you know, you want to be the best of the best and you want to be someone that people look up to. It, it's difficult then to recognize when you need to take a step back, when you need to check yourself, check your behaviors or check somebody else's behaviors, and, you know, figure out what's appropriate, what's not and call in and call out what, what you need to. Um, so I think that actually leads me to another question I have for you, which is just how do you see, how do you think Tulane students can be good role models for healthy masculinity and for violence prevention within their communities? And what skills does it take to do that? That's a great question. Um, you know, I see a lot, um, uh, like in terms of a couple of different things, like, um, and I see students doing this work already. Um, uh, for example, um, a lot of the peer educators um, that are focused on sexual violence prevention. Well, the skills that it takes, I think, are, are A, learning how to step up and step back, as you've said. That's like number one. And where you start, I think, in that process is like accepting your role within that too. Like being, um, A, like being okay with yourself and what that means to you and B, being able to like communicate that. Um, that's one skill and allowing for kind of like active listening and engagement, because I think if you go in, I mean, this is just health promotion in general, right? Whereas like you go in and you tell people what's really bad and what's wrong about what they're doing, they're going to tell you to, they're going to say, screw you. Um, and why wouldn't they? Because people are defensive and also like don't want to be told that they're wrong. And if, um, and I think you have to allow for like a more nuanced conversation to really hear what that person's telling you and to unpack it and to provide like a healthy alternative, right? Um, and recognizing that it's not gonna happen in probably in one interaction, right? Those are probably gonna be like continuous interactions. And the more folks that you can engage in those conversations with, the larger like social norm shift you're gonna see too, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's um, one piece of it. And then I also think that um, well, I mean, there's so many different ways that this could, this could happen. I think um, in terms of Tulane students doing this too, Sex Week is like a really great example of um, something that could really, really work well. Because you're providing for different types of spaces, right? Um, again, like thinking about this intersectionality, we're not all going to, uh, intersectionally, I should say, it's like, um, we're not all gonna think about this the same way. We don't all experience um, sex the same way. We don't all experience um, oppression the same way. You know, there's different layers to this. So something like Sex Week where you have different activities um, that are really geared towards different groups to allow them the space to kind of process and, and, and have a space just for them, I think it's really, really important. Um, particularly like in a, you know, at a predominantly white institution, right? Where you see different levels of oppression playing out. Um, for students of color, for LGBTQIA plus students, um, that, you know, their issues like in this realm are different, right? Everybody experiences this differently. So how do we talk about sex and allow for those spaces where people feel like they have the support and power to not be judged and to also like um, speak their truth, really? I also think um, there's a couple of different elements around um, again, like sex and pleasure that we need to be talking about too. Um, again, like th th that goes back to that key piece of like telling people that something is bad and wrong doesn't work. Like people are gonna have sex, it's part of life. <laughs> We've gotta stop that argument because it's just never like, you can see that oppressive systems like around abstinence and whatever, they don't work. 
right? They don't work. And in fact, really encourage unhealthy behaviors around sex that can lead to sexual violence. Mm -hmm. um, so the more that we can just accept that and allow for this to be something that people can do safely and for pleasure, um, I think, again, the more likely you are going to see some of these things shift and change. Um, because there's a lot of shame. There's just so much shame, I think, associated with this in general. Um, we've got we've to pull that away and we've got to give people the tools to really feel um, powerful and like in, in, in their own sexuality. Um, and then I think that communication piece is really key too, right? Because someone could be feel really great and really powerful in their own sexuality, but not be listening to their, to their sexual partner in that as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, how do you find joy and like power and having that, that dual communication and like finding mutual pleasure, mm -hmm. um, I think is really important too. Those are like a couple of examples where I see students doing that, you know, and it, it doesn't even have to be something as formal as like, hey, I'm a peer educator. Hey, I'm a sex week coordinator. I think the more that students can engage with conversations with their friends that can attend these types of events um, that can, you know, like serve as someone that is willing and open um, to these types of conversations, the more you're going to shift those norms too, um, you know, because until we until we allow students to recognize like hey actually most of us don't really think that this is cool you know okay. most of us actually want to be like active participants in sex with our partners most of us want to show emotionality most of us want to communicate um and giving them the tools to do that like the, the quicker this will move i think yeah, yeah. Absolutely. and and i'm um, being advocates for that too like mm -hmm. You know, saying to the administration and to uh, like, you know, other like um, organizational institutions of like, this is what we want and need, mm -hmm. right? Because oftentimes when you talk to people, they do know what they want and need. And we have to, you know, we have to allow them to have um, some control and decision, you know, making power in, in their process as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's informing students that these events are happening and they can get involved, yep. even by, uh, I think one thing that has happened with changing to like a virtual setting is you have the comfortability to attend events from your own home, right? You don't physically have to be present for them. You have to be present like in your mind um, and just be open to listening what, what people are saying and get that exposure. Um, and I think for some of our students, they don't know that a lot of these events happen or like they'll hear the title and be like, oh, that might not be for me without really having the understanding of what things are. Um, or knowing like you can really learn something from this and like it might pique your interests or there might be underlying issues there or underlying like themes there that you're passionate about um, because it's not just, you know, sex week. We're only just talking about like the title itself, but there's different components within that week that like adhere um, to a lot of different people's interests. Um, and yeah. that's like getting our students to go and attend these things um, is extremely important and know about them. Yep, yep. It's like, how do you kind of distribute that information and allow people to be comfortable in those settings? Because I agree with you. I've seen more people attending different types of events too virtually than maybe would have happened in person too. And maybe allows yeah. for like, you know, this is purely conjecture. I don't know. But, you know, allows for um, people to like, feel safe in their own space and check out when they need to check out, right? Yeah. Or check in when they want to check in. Um, it kind of allows for that in an interesting way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I really enjoyed the conversation with you, Dr. Fleckman, and was just wondering for those that are watching, how can they stay up to date with your work and what you're doing here at Tulane? Um, and maybe like some of the courses that you are teaching. Definitely. Um, so first and foremost, totally encourage people to go to the Violence Prevention Institute website. Um, for Tulane, it's a great resource, I think, around all areas of violence prevention. So we not only talk about um, like faculty and staff that are working in the violence pre prevention realm, but we help connect students to different opportunities, whether that be research or more pra practice-oriented opportunities to work in this. Um, also can like see my some of my work up there along with some other folks that we're doing as an institute. Um, there's different funding opportunities up there. Yeah, it's just a nice resource and encourage people to reach out to me too. Um, 
J Fleckma, F L E C K M A, so without the N, at uh, Tulane.edu, and I'm totally happy to talk to folks about these, uh, you know, issues that we that we're talking about here today. And then um, I'm teaching. Uh, I teach a, a public health approaches to sexual violence course. Um, it's a public health course for undergraduate students. Uh, most of the students are juniors and seniors because there are a couple of prerequisites um, in public health, but definitely can work out with students if, if they're really interested in taking it. And I te teach a couple of graduate classes at the School of Public Health for graduate students seeing this as well. The Violence as a Public Health Issue course and then the our Violence Prevention Studio Seminar where we really talk about solutions oriented um, content. And yeah, I really enjoyed talking to you all today and it's really cool to see um, this type of work happening. Thank you. Uh, it's, been, it's been great. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Magnus, sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna say thank you, Dr. Fleckman, for joining us today and sharing your insight. Um, I had a great time, definitely feel like I learned something and I hope that the students watching did as well. Absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. Well, thank you, and we hope to have you back again to talk more about this work. Um, and next semester, we'll be featuring more student voices, which I think will be to include in the conversation, too. So. Sounds great. Thank you all so much. Thank you. See Bye. you later.